This place is uh, an old home for me. I spend a lot of my life here. And I'm glad to be back again. I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces here. And I'm glad to see a lot of new faces, too. You've got a great school, as I'm sure you don't need me to tell you. And I'm glad to join you here in it today. The problem of evil is raised by the existence of suffering in the world. Can it be true that a world which has such suffering in it is also a world that's governed by an omniscient, omnipotent, perfectly good God, as Christians believe? A theodicy is one way to answer this question in the affirmative. A theodicy is an attempt to show that there's a morally sufficient reason for God to allow suffering. In the history of the discussions of the problem of evil, a great deal of effort has been expended on proposing or attacking theodicies and the morally sufficient reasons which theodicies propose. Generally, when a theodicy proposes a morally sufficient reason that explains why God allows suffering, that reason is centered on some benefit which couldn't be gotten without the suffering and which outweighs it. And the benefit is most commonly thought of as some intrinsically valuable thing supposed to be essential to general human flourishing. So, for example, the well-known theologian John Hick has proposed what has come to be called a soul-making theodicy. It justifies suffering as building the character of the sufferer and by that means contributing to the flourishing of the sufferer. Or to take another example, the well-known philosopher Richard Swinburne has argued that suffering contributes to the flourishing of sufferers because in suffering a person is useful to others and being useful to others is on his account an important part of human flourishing. Scholars who have attacked the odysseys such as these have argued that the proposed benefit could have been gotten without the suffering or that the suffering is not a morally acceptable means to the benefit, something along these lines. But these attacks on theodicy share an assumption with the theodicies themselves. Both the attacks and the theodicies suppose that a person's flourishing in one way or another would be sufficient to justify God in allowing that person's suffering if only the suffering and the flourishing were connected in the right way. In this lecture, I want to call this assumption into question. I don't think that human suffering can be justified only in terms of the intrinsically valuable things which make for human flourishing, however we understand that flourishing. And that's because human beings can set their hearts on things which are not necessary for flourishing, and they suffer when they lose or fail to get what they set their hearts on. And that suffering also needs to be addressed in consideration of the problem of evil. The suffering to which I want to call attention can be thought of in terms of what the psalmist calls the desires of the heart. When the psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of the heart, we all have some idea what the psalmist is promising. We're clear, for example, that some abstract theological good which a person doesn't care much about doesn't count as one of the desires of that person's heart. Suffering also arises when a human being fails to get a desire of her heart or has and then loses a desire of her heart. I don't know how to make the notion of a desire of the heart precise, but clearly we do have some intuitive grasp of it. And we commonly use the expression or others related to it in ordinary discourse. We say, for example, that a person is heartsick because he's lost his heart's desire. He's filled with heartache because his heart's desire is kept from him. He loses heart because something he'd put his heart into is taken from him. It would have been different from him for him if he'd wanted it only half heartily, heartily, but since it was what he had at heart, He's likely to be heart sore a long time over it, unless, of course, he has a change of heart about it, and so on and so on. Perhaps we could say that a person's heart's desire is a particular kind of commitment on her part to something, a person or a project, which matters greatly to her, but which is not essential to her flourishing. Sometimes philosophers talk about our beliefs as a connected web 
with some beliefs peripheral and others central to the web. Maybe there's also a web of desire. The desire of a person's heart can then be thought of as a desire which is at or near the center of the web of desire for her. If she loses what she wants when her desire is at or near the center of the web, then other things which she had wanted begin to lose their ability to attract her because what she had most centrally wanted is gone. The web of desire starts to fall apart when the center doesn't hold, we might say. And that is why the ordinary good things of life, like food and work, fail to draw a person who has lost the desires of her heart. She's heartbroken, we say, and that's why she has no heart now for anything else. If things essential to human flourishing are intrinsically valuable for all human beings, then those things which are the desires of the heart can be thought of as the things which have value for a particular person, just because she set her heart on them. Think about the value a child has for her mother. Mother doesn't love her child because she thinks that child is so intrinsically valuable. It's the other way around. The child is infinitely valuable in her mother's eyes because the mother loves the child so much. In the same way, the value a heart's desire has for a person is derivative from her love for it and not the other way around. A loving philosopher father who is trying to deal gently with his small daughter's childish tantrums finally said to her with exasperated adult feeling, it isn't reasonable to cry about these things. Presumably the father means that the things for which his little daughter was weeping did not have much value on the scale which measures the intrinsic value of good things essential to human flourishing. And no doubt he was right in that assessment. But there's another scale by which to measure too. And that's the scale which measures the value a thing has for a particular person because of the love she has for it. That second scale can't be reduced to the first. We don't care just about human flourishing. We also care about those things which are the desires of our hearts. And we suffer when we are denied our heart's desires. For my part, I would say that it is not reasonable to say to a weeping child that it's not reasonable for her to weep about the loss of something she had her heart set on. Suffering which stems from a loss of the heart's desire is often enough compatible with human flourishing. Think, for example, of people who were slaves at a time when slavery was legal in this country. Think of Sojourner Truth, who was sold away from her parents at the age of nine. Or think of Harriet Tubman, who sustained permanent neurological damage from the beatings she sustained in adolescence. If any human lives manifest flourishing, the lives of these women certainly do. Most people would suppose that each of these women is an exemplar of a highly admirable, meaningful human life. And yet, surely, each of these women was irrevocably deprived of something at some time on which she had set her heart. Thinkers in varying cultures, including some Stoics, Buddhists, and many in the Christian tradition, have been fiercely committed to the position that human flourishing is independent of the vicissitudes of fortune that cause heartbreak. For example, on the worldview of Thomas Aquinas, which makes flourishing a matter of union with God, most of the evils human beings suffer are compatible with flourishing. That's because a human being can be in relationship of love with God and can also experience the consolation of that relationship even when she's afflicted with serious suffering of body and mind. The belief that flourishing is compatible with heartbrokenness is also common among the reflective in our own culture. So, for example, in a moving passage, born of his own long experience caring for and living with the severely disabled, Jean Vanier says about the disabled and about himself too, he says this, it's on your handout, I won't cue you to the handout, I'll just expect you to use it. He says, <clears throat> 
We can only accept the pain in our lives if we discover our true self beneath all the masks and realize that if we are broken, we are also more beautiful than we ever dare to suspect. When we realize our brokenness, we do not have to fall into depression. Seeing our own brokenness and beauty allows us to recognize hidden under the brokenness and self-centeredness of others, their beauty, their value, and their sacredness. This discovery is a blessed moment, a moment of grace, and a moment of enlightenment that comes in a meeting with the God of love, who reveals to us that we are beloved, and so is everyone else. We can start to live the pain of loss and accept anguish because a new love and a new consciousness of self are being given to us. A particularly poignant example of this kind of view is given by John Hull in his memoir about his slow descent into blindness. Hull spends many pages documenting his powerful aversion to going blind and the great suffering caused him by the blindness that finally enveloped him. But then he recounts a religious experience he had while he was listening to music in a church. As he describes that experience, he summarizes his attitude toward his blindness in this passage. He says, The thought keeps coming back to me. Could there be a strange way in which blindness is a dark, paradoxical gift? Does it offer a way of life, a a purification, an economy? Is it really like a kind of painful purging through a death? If blindness is a gift, it is not one that I would wish on anybody. But as the whole place and my mind were filled with that wonderful music, I found myself saying, I accept the gift, I accept the gift. I was filled with a profound sense of worship, I felt that I was in the very presence of God, that the giver of the gift had drawn near to me to inspect his handiwork. If I hardly dared approach him, he hardly dared approach me. He had, as it were, thrown his cloak of darkness around me from a distance, but had now drawn near to seek a kind of reassurance from me that everything was all right, that he had not misjudged the situation, that he did not have to stay. It's all right. I was saying to him, there's no need to wait. Go on, you can go now. Everything's fine. And everything is fine. In some sense, having to do with relationship to God and so with flourishing too, on Hull's view of flourishing and as far as that goes, on Aquinas' view too. I have no wish to undercut anything in this moving passage. Hull's thought, like the thought of Jean Lanier, seems to me to be as true as it is moving. But because things can be fine in this sense, even for those who suffer greatly, some stern-minded thinkers of the world suppose that a person who is suffering because of the loss of the desires of his heart just needs to let those desires go. Now there is something to be said for this attitude. Ordinarily a parent's good is not impugned if the parent refuses to provide for the child anything, whatever, which the child sets its heart on. A child could set his heart on things very destructive to him, for example, or even on evil things. And no doubt this is only the beginning of the list of such very problematic instances of heart's desires. In such cases, even if it were possible to do so, a good parent will not give the child what the child desires just because the parent loves the child and wants what is best for the child. She's at cross purposes with the child just because she cares as much as she does that the child flourish. And now this point holds with regard to God and the suffering of adult human beings. In cases in which the desires of a person's heart are seriously inimical to his flourishing, reasonable people are unlikely to suppose that some explanation is needed for a good God's failure to give that person the desires of his heart. But if we exclude all such cases, there nonetheless remain many instances in which a person is heartbroken in consequence of having set his heart in humanly understandable and entirely appropriate ways, on something whose value for him 
is derivative of his love for it. Even with regard to this restricted class of cases, stern-minded thinkers suppose that as long as flourishing is preserved, the desires of the heart should be abandoned if cleaving to them leads to suffering. For stern-minded thinkers, there is no reason why a good God should provide whatever goods not necessary for her flourishing a human person has fixed her heart on. We can think about their position this way. Stern-minded thinkers take human flourishing to be a very great good. For those who think of flourishing as a relationship to God, it can seem an infinite good or a good too great to be commensurable with other goods. If God provides this good for a human person, then on the stern-minded attitude, that is or ought to be enough for that person. A person who does not find this greatest of all goods good enough, on the view of the stern-minded, is like a person who wins the lottery, but is nonetheless unhappy because she didn't get exactly what she wanted for her birthday. In effect, then, the stern-minded attitude is unwilling to assign a positive value to anything which is not essential to a person's flourishing. Consequently, the stern-minded attitude is, at best, unwilling to accord any value to the desires of the heart, and at worst, eager to get rid of those desires themselves. A stern-minded attitude of this sort is persistent in the history of Christian thought from the patristic period onward. In its patristic form, it can be seen vividly in a story which the patristic author John Cashin tells about a monk named Pater Mutus. It's worth quoting at length the heart-rendingly horrible story which Cashin recounts with so much oblivious admiration. Here's what Cashin says. Pater Mutus' constant perseverance in his request to be admitted into the monastery finally induced the monks to receive him, along with his little son, who was about eight years old. To test Pater Mutus and to see if he would be more moved by family affection and the love of his own brood than by the obedience and mortification of Christ, which every monk should prefer to his love, the monks deliberately neglected the child dressed him in rags, and even subjected the child to cuffs and slaps, which the father saw some of them inflict on the innocent for no reason, so that the father never saw his son without the son's cheeks being marked by the signs of tears. Although he saw his son, his child, being treated like this day after day before his eyes, the father's feelings remained firm and unmoving for the love of Christ. The superior of the monastery decided to test the father's strength of will still further. One day, when he noticed the child weeping, he pretended to be enraged at the child and ordered the father to pick up his son and throw him into the Nile. The father, as if the command had been given him by our Lord, at once ran and snatched up his son and carried him in his own arms to the river bank to throw him in. The deed would have been done had not some of the brethren been stationed in advance to watch the riverbank carefully. As the child was thrown, they caught him. Thus they prevented the command, performed as it was by the father's obedience and devotion, from having any effect. Now Cashin plainly prizes Padramudas' actions and desires, but surely virtually all of us would find them chilling and reprehensible. What Cashin admires in Pater Mutus is in fact the determination with which Pater Mutus tries to eradicate in himself one of the most powerful and natural heart's desires in the interest of focusing all his care solely on flourishing, spiritually understood. An attitude similar to Cashin's but less appalling can still be found more than a millennium later in some texts, but not others, of the work of Teresa of Avila. Writing to her sister nuns, Teresa says, Oh, how desirable is the union with God's will. Happy the soul that has reached it. Such a soul will live tranquilly in this life and in the next as well, 
Nothing in earthly events afflicts it unless it finds itself in some danger of losing God. Neither sickness, nor poverty, nor death. For this soul sees well that the Lord knows what he is doing better than the soul knows what it is desiring. But alas for us, how few there must be who reach union with God's will. I tell you, I am writing this with much pain upon seeing myself so far away from such union and all through my own fault. Don't think the matter lies in my being so conformed to the will of God that if my father or brother dies, I don't feel it, or that if there are trials or sicknesses, I suffer them happily. Not feeling it when one's father dies, not weeping with grief over his death, is in Teresa's view a good spiritual condition which she is not yet willing to attribute to herself. Teresa is here echoing a tradition which finds its prime medieval exemplar in Augustine's confessions. Augustine says that at the death of his mother, by a powerful command of his will, he kept himself from weeping at her funeral only to disgrace himself in his own eyes later by weeping copiously in private. In the same text from which I just quoted, Teresa emphasizes the importance of love of neighbor. But in fact, it doesn't seem possible for the love of neighbor to cohere with the stern-minded attitude manifested by Teresa and Augustine in the face of the death, real or imagined, of a beloved parent. For Aquinas, who has the best account of love I know, it's the nature of love to desire the good of the beloved and to desire union with the beloved. But the desire for the good of the beloved is frustrated if the beloved gets sick or dies. Or if the stern-minded attitude is unwilling to concede that point, then this much is uncontrovertible, even on the stern-minded attitude. The desire for union with the beloved is frustrated when the beloved dies and is absent. And one way or another then, the desires of love are frustrated when the beloved dies. And consequently, there's something bad and lamentable, something worth tears, something whose loss brings affliction with it about the death of any person whom one loves, one's father or even one's neighbor, whom one is also bound to love, as Teresa says. Unmoved tranquility at the death of another person is therefore incompatible with love of that person. To the extent to which one loves another person, one cannot be unmoved at his death. And so contrary to what the stern-minded thinkers suppose, love of neighbor is in fact incompatible with a stern-minded attitude. Teresa's attitude toward her father's death, as she imagines it would be if it were what she takes to be ideal, that attitude can usefully be contrasted with Bernard of Clairvaux's attitude toward the death of his brother. Commenting on his own grief at that death, Bernard says to his religious community, he says, You, my sons, know how deep my sorrow is, how galling a wound it leaves. And addressing himself, he says, Flow on, flow on, my tears. Let my tears gush forth like fountains. Reflecting on his own unwillingness to repudiate his great sorrow over his brother's death, his failure, that is, to follow Augustine's example, Bernard says, It is but human and necessary that we respond to our friends with feeling, that we be happy in their company, disappointed in their absence. Social intercourse, especially between friends, cannot be purposeless. The reluctance to part and the yearning for each other when separated indicate how meaningful their mutual love must be when they are together. And Bernard is hardly the only figure in the Christian tradition who fails to accept and affirm Cassian's attitude. Aquinas is another such. So, for example, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, Aquinas wants to explain why Christ told his disciples that he was going to God the Father as a means of comforting them at the prospect of being separated from himself. In trying to explain this passage in the Gospel, Aquinas says, It is common among friends 
to be less sad over the absence of a friend when the friend is going to something that exalts him. And that's why the Lord gives the disciples this reason for his leaving in order to console them. Unlike Teresa, who repudiates grief at the prospect of losing her father, in his general reflection here, as in many other places as well, Aquinas is accepting the appropriateness of a person's grief at the loss of a loved person and validating the need for consolation for such grief. So Aquinas is not to be ranked among the members of the stern-minded group any more than Bernard of Clairvaux is. And of course in other moods, when she's not self-consciously evaluating her own spiritual progress, Teresa herself sounds much more like Bernard and Aquinas than she sounds like Cassian. On this subject, then, the Christian tradition is of two minds. Not all its influential figures stand with Cassian on this score, and even among those who do, many are double-minded about it. But here, somebody will surely object. Somebody will say, look, isn't it a part of Christian doctrine that God allows the death of any person who dies? Does anyone die when God wills that that person live? So when a person dies, the objector will think, on Christian theology, isn't it the will of God that that person die? In what sense then could Teresa be united with God in will if she grieved over her father's death? How could she be united with God as she wants to be if her will is frustrated in what God's will accepts or commands? That's the objection. In my view, the position presupposed by these questions rests on too simple an understanding of God's will and union with God. To see why, assume with Christian theology and with uh, Teresa that at death, Teresa's father is united with God in heaven. Then the death of Teresa's father has opposite effects for Teresa and for God. It unites Teresa's father permanently with God, but it keeps Teresa from union with her father, at least for the remainder of Teresa's earthly life. For this reason, love's desire for union with the beloved cannot be fulfilled in the same way for a human person as for God. If Teresa's will is united with God's will in desiring union with her father, then Teresa's will must also be frustrated at the very event her father's dying which fulfills God's will with respect to this desire. Something analogous can also be said about the other desire of love, for the good of the beloved. If Teresa desires the good of her father, she can only desire what her own mind sees as that good. But unlike God's mind, her her mind's ability to see the good is limited. To the extent to which Teresa's will is united with God's will in desiring the good of the beloved, then Teresa will also desire for the beloved person things different from those desired by God, in virtue of Teresa's differing ability to see the good for the beloved person. It's easy to become confused here because the phrase, the good, can be used in two different ways. Philosophers have called these two different ways the attributive use, of the expression and the referential use. An expression like the good of the beloved can be used to refer to concrete particular things which are conducive to the beloved's well-being and then the expression is being used referentially. Or the expression can be used opaquely to pick out anything whatever as long as it's under the description the good of the beloved and then the expression is being used attributively. A mother who's baffled by the quarrels among her adult children and clueless about how to bring about a just peace for them, she may say despairingly, I just want the good for everybody. And she is then using the expression the good attributively with no idea at all of how to use it referentially. If Teresa were tranquil over any affliction which happens to her father, it would be because she thought that by this tranquility, her will would be united to God's will in willing the good for her father. In this thought of hers, the good would be used attributively 
to designate whatever God thinks is good. But this can't be the way the good is used in any thought of God's. It's not true that God desires as good, the good of a beloved person, that God desires as good for a beloved person, whatever it is that God desires for him. When God desires the good for somebody, he desires it by desiring concrete particular things as good for that person. Consequently, when we say that God desires the good for a person, the expression the good is here used referentially. For this reason, when in an effort to will what God wills, Teresa desires whatever happens to her father as the good for her father, she thereby actually fails to will what God wills. To be united with God in willing the good requires willing for the beloved, as God does, particular things which are in fact the good for the beloved, and doing so requires recognizing those things which constitute that good. Sometimes, as Plato teaches us, it's easier to see a point about the psyche by thinking first in larger terms about a whole society. We can see the point at issue here by thinking about what happened in China after the death of its ruler Mao Zedong. At that time, there were many factions competing for power. The Chinese called one of these groups the whatever faction because the members of that group were committed to maintaining as true anything Mao said, whatever it was, and to maintaining as good anything Mao had commanded, whatever it was. In trying to desire whatever happens as good because God wills it, a person is, as it were, trying to be a part of a whatever faction for God. She's trying to maintain as good anything that happens, whatever it is, on the grounds that that is what God wills. By contrast, in his great lament over the death of his brother, Bernard of Clairvaux is willing to affirm both his passionate grief over the loss of his brother and his acceptance of God's allowing that death. Bernard says, Shall I find fault with God's judgment because I wince from the pain? I have no wish to repudiate the decrees of God, nor do I question that judgment by which each of us has received his due. So Bernard grieves over this particular death as a bad thing, even while he accepts that God's allowing this bad thing is a good thing. Understanding the subtle but important difference in attitude between Teresa and Bernard on this score helps to elucidate an otherwise peculiar part of the book of Job. In the book of Job, God rebukes Job's comforters. God tells the comforters that they did not say of God the thing that is right, unlike God's servant Job, who did. But here's the peculiar part. What the comforters had said was that God is perfectly good and justified in allowing Job to suffer as he did. What Job had said in bitterness is that his suffering was bad and that God shouldn't have allowed it to happen. How is it that in the story, God says that Job was right in what he said and the comforters were wrong in what they said? In my view, the answer lies in seeing that the comforters took Job's suffering to be good just because, in their view, Job's suffering was willed by God. In effect, the comforters were, and wanted to be, part of the whatever faction of God. Job, by contrast, was intransigent in his refusal to be partisan in this way. And so, on the apparently paradoxical view of the book of Job, in opposing God, Job is more allied with God's will than the comforters are. And that's why, when in the story God comes to adjudicate, he sides with Job who had opposed him and not with the comforters who were trying to be God's partisans. I think the apparent paradox here can be resolved by considering the Thomistic distinction between God's antecedent and God's consequent will. Roughly put, for Aquinas, God's antecedent will is what God would have willed if things in the world had been up to God alone. God's consequent will is what God in fact wills, given what God's creatures will. God's consequent will is his will for the greatest good available in the circumstances, at least some of which are generated through creaturely free will.
This distinction is one familiar to all of us, just not under those names, and it holds also for human beings. When you want to have a happy family dinner with your children around you at the table, you are operating with your antecedent will. When you send the two-year-old to his room because he won't stop throwing his food on the floor, you're operating on your consequent will. On this distinction, whatever happens in the world happens only because it is in accordance with God's will. But that will is God's consequent will. God's consequent will, however, is different from his antecedent will, and many of the things which happen in the world are not in accordance with God's antecedent will. To try to be in accord with God's will by taking as acceptable, as unworthy of sorrow, everything that happens, is to confuse the consequent will of God with the antecedent will. It's to accept as intrinsically good even those things which God wills only in his consequent will. But the distinction between God's antecedent and consequent will is meant to help us understand that God does not will as intrinsically good everything he wills. What he wills in his consequent will might be only what is the best available in the circumstances, and the best available in the circumstances might be only the lesser of two evils. And so to accept as good whatever happens, on the grounds that it's God's will, is the wrong way to try to be united with God. One can desire as intrinsically good what one's own mind takes to be intrinsically good in the circumstances, or... One can desire as intrinsically good whatever happens on the grounds that it's God's will. But only the desire for what one's own mind takes to be intrinsically good can be in accordance with God's will. For the same reasons, only a desire of this sort is conducive to union with God. Although it appears paradoxical then, the closest a human person may be able to come in this life to uniting her will with God's will, may include her willing things, say that a beloved person not die, which are opposed to God's consequent will. Something also needs to be said in this connection about the Christian doctrine mandating denial of the self. This much understanding of the two different ways in which one can try to will what God wills shows that there are also two correspondingly different interpretations of that doctrine. Passion and others who hold the stern-minded attitude manifest one such understanding. A person who shares Cashin's attitude will attempt to deny his self by, in effect, refusing to let his own mind and his own will exercise their characteristic functions. That's because a person who attempts to see as good whatever happens on the grounds that whatever happens is will by God is trying to suppress or trying to fail to acquire his own understanding of the good. And a person who attempts to will as good whatever happens on the same grounds is trying to suppress the desires his own will forms or trying not to acquire the desires his own will would have formed if he weren't in the grip of a stern-minded attitude. To attempt to deny the self in the stern-minded way is thus to try not to have a self at all. A woman who says sincerely to her father, I want only what you want and whatever you think is good is good in my view too, is a woman who's trying to be at one with her father by having no self of her own. A little reflection shows that contrary to first appearances, this no-self position is actually incompatible with Christ's command to take up one's cross daily and deny oneself. That's because one can't crucify a self one doesn't have. To crucify oneself is to have desires and also to be willing to act counter to them. C.S. Lewis, who argues for a similar position, puts the point this way. He says... It would not be possible to live from moment to moment willing nothing but submission to God. What would the material for the submission be? It would seem contradictory to say what I will is to subject what I will to God's will because that second what has no content. An adherent to the whatever faction of God can't deny himself because he's constructed his desires in such a way that 
whatever he wills, he doesn't will counter to his own desires. That's because a person who is a partisan of the whatever faction of God has only an overarching desire for whatever it may be that is God's will. And he attempts to stamp out of himself any desire which is in conflict with that overarching desire. He doesn't want to let God's desires take precedence over his own. He just wants to have no desires of his own. And that is why, unlike the real Teresa who was full of human emotion, such a person wouldn't weep if her father died. For a person in the grip of the stern-minded attitude, whatever happens is in accordance with her one overarching desire to will whatever God wills. And that's why whatever happens is not a source of sorrow for her. In virtue of the fact that she's tried to stamp out of herself all desires, except the one desire for whatever it may be that is God's will, she's tried to have no desires, which are frustrated by whatever happens, as long as she herself remains committed to to willing whatever God wills. By contrast, a self-crucifying denier of the self has desires for things his own intellect finds good, so that he's vulnerable to grief in the frustration of those desires. But he prefers his grief and frustration to willing what is opposed to God's will. In this sense, he wills that God's will be done. His desire is that God's desires take precedence over his own. When Jesus says to God the Father, not my will but yours be done, he's not expressing the no-self position. On the contrary, as Aquinas also argues, in this line, Jesus is acknowledging that he has desires of his own and that they may be in conflict with God's desires. But in virtue of preferring his suffering to the violation of God's will, Jesus is also willing that God's desires take precedence over his own. And this is the sense in which he is willing that God's will be done. C.S. Lewis puts a related point this way. He says, in order to submit the will to God, we must have a will. And that will must have objects. Christian renunciation does not mean stoic apathy, but a readiness to prefer God to inferior ends which are in themselves lawful. Hence Jesus brought to Gethsemane a will and a strong will to escape suffering and death if such escape were compatible with the Father's will combined with a perfect readiness for obedience if it were not. To deny oneself is therefore a matter of being willing both to have desires of one's own and to go contrary to them. Or put another way, it's a matter of being willing to suffer the violation of one's will. Insofar as the stern-minded attitude seeks to eradicate desires other than the desire for flourishing, it in effect refuses to have a self to deny. And so it's more aptly characterized as an extreme attempt to avoid suffering rather than as a self-denial. So for all these reasons, I think the stern-minded attitude is to be repudiated. Whatever its antiquity and ancestry, many in the Christian tradition, including Aquinas, do not accept it. And in my view, they do well to reject it. It's an unpalatable position, even from the point of view of an ascetically minded Christianity. It it underlies the repellent and lamentable mindset exemplified in Cashin's story. It's also incompatible with the love of one's neighbor and consequently incompatible with the love of God too. Contrary to what the stern-minded attitude thinks, there are things worth desiring other than the intrinsically valuable things necessary for human flourishing. And the desires for these things should not be suppressed. In fact, as Cashin's story of Potter makes plain, the attempt to stamp out the desires of the heart does not lead to human excellence, as Cashin thought it did. It leads to a kind of inhuman willingness to murder one's own child in the service of a confused and reprehensible attempt at self-denial. There is an apparent paradox here, however. As I introduced the phrase, the desires of the heart are desires which are central to a person's web of desires, but their objects are not essential to a person's flourishing. 
On the face of it then, losing the objects of such desires or giving up those desires themselves is compatible with a person's flourishing. But the rejection of the stern-minded attitude seems to imply that a person's flourishing requires that he have desires of the heart and that he strive to have what he desires. Consequently, it also seems to imply that it's essential to a person's flourishing that he have desires of the heart. And so it seems to follow paradoxically that it's essential to human flourishing that a person desire and seek to have things, at least some of which are not essential to his flourishing. In recent work, the well-known philosopher Harry Frankfurt has argued that it's useful for a person to have final ends. This is paradoxical, too. The central idea of Frankfurt's argument is the thought that a person with no final ends at all will have a life which lacks well-being. And so for this reason, final ends are useful for well-being. The apparently paradoxical claim about the desires of the heart can be understood analogously. Human beings are constructed in such a way that they naturally set their heart on things in addition to and different from their own flourishing. That's why confining a person's desires just to his own flourishing has something inhuman about it. A person's flourishing therefore also requires that he care about and seek to have things beside those that are essential to human flourishing. On Frankfurt's view, having a desire for something which is not a means to anything else is a means to a person's well-being. On the view I've argued for here, a person's having a desire for things which are not essential to his flourishing is in fact essential to his flourishing. And so although no particular thing valued as a desire of the heart is essential to a person's flourishing, human flourishing isn't possible in the absence of the desires of the heart. So here's what I want to say in conclusion. For all these reasons, we can safely leave the objections of the stern-minded attitude to one side. And so it remains the case that some justification is also needed for suffering stemming from unfulfilled or frustrated desires of the heart. For this reason, theodicies which focus just on one or another variety of flourishing as the morally sufficient reason for God's allowing evil, are at best incomplete. Even if we give such theodicies everything they want as regards the relation between suffering and a person's flourishing, there remains the problem of suffering stemming from the loss of the desires of one's heart. And so the desires of the heart also need to be considered in connection with the problem of evil. And here's a promissory note and then I'm done. For my part, I think it's possible to find a way to develop traditional theodicies to include satisfactory consideration of the problem posed by the desires of the heart. But clearly, at least clearly in my own view, that complicated and challenging task is a project for a book, not a lecture. I did try to write a book like that, and it's in production, but I still can't give it in one lecture. So for today, it's enough for me to have shown you something about the nature of the desires of the heart and to show their importance for human flourishing. So I want to finish just by reminding us of the psalmist's promise, which has got to be part of the story of any successful theodicy in my view. Here's the psalmist's promise. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I'm done. Thanks. Thanks.